It's here. Long awaited. Had a chance to sit down with Coach Rule this summer. It was fantastic. A little football, a little family, a lot of community, and a lot of what's going on behind the scenes. There's always kind of a method to the madness. Coach Rule and I take a deep dive, and we go inside to see what's behind this Husker culture that's off to a such a good start. We'll release it in pieces. It won't disappoint. Well, at least I hope it doesn't disappoint. It's Coach Rule. How could it? So you're fresh off the move, too. So kind of, yeah. right? A couple of sales, not really the move. Right. <laughs> what's that been like? Uh, my wife's a saint. Like, like I went back, so... so I got so much to do here, right? So like, I haven't wanted to go back, and Julie's been coming here. And last week it was like, you know, dance recitals, um, selling. So we actually own two places there because we bought a little cabin on a lake for my parents. You know, I wanted my, my dad to be with me. And um, so we're selling both those houses. And uh, like getting back there and feeling like the strain of every day, how long she's been doing that, three kids. Her father was in a nursing home, recently passed away. So mm. she's burying her father. She's taking care of our three kids. She's coordinating the sales of two houses. She's coordinating the purchase of a house here. She's coordinating all these moves. Our son's staying in Charlotte next year. And I think it's hard that I'm like, you know, trying to FaceTime an 18 year old kid and can get him hyped up about Nebraska. Like it's just humbling when you get back there and see it. And um, I think I got there just in the nick of time <laughs> because I think, uh, you know, being there for, for last week really helped, you know. So there's two things that you said there. One, I'll go back to the night of the Jet Awards. Uh, we were just kind of shooting the breeze. And he said, hey, you know, I'd, I'd like to get back and go see Brian. He's, he's, he's flying into town. Yeah. And I, re I just, I remember kind of your sentiment, how you felt. You're like, I'm, I, and you said it out loud. You said, I miss my son. Yeah. And as a guy, you know, it's been five years now since I lost uh, my dad. And he was my, he's my best friend. Mm. Right. So right. Big night. I'm in seeing and all for the first 45, 50 minutes. I just was going to, I was trying to figure out how we could get you back <laughs> to Lincoln. ASAP. Figure out. Which it is, but it kind of leads me to believe, cause you said you wanted your dad with you and cause that's important to you. Ooh. Son of a pastor. It's well documented, right? You have some of the mannerisms. You've talked about your affinity for high school coaches because he was a high school coach. Mm -hmm. What else is in there that that you draw from where you're like, you know what? I want my parents right where I'm at. I need my dad. I'm 47, 48 years old. I, I, need, I need those people in my life close to me. Well, you know, it, it kind of, it, it was an evolution, right? So my dad... So my first year at Temple, we went two and ten. The next year, he came down for like a, like a couple of days, like at the end of spring, at the end of spring, oh, excuse me, a fall camp. And we beat Vanderbilt in the first game, which at the time Vanderbilt was coming off a seven win season. We were huge underdogs. We beat him forty two seven. Yeah, that was Franklin, right? Yeah, just after he had left. That's right. Derek Mason just took over, and it's a pretty big deal. So then the next year, my dad comes down for all of training camp, and. Um, we beat Penn State the first time for the first game for the first time in 74 years. And I'm not the smartest guy, but I was like, maybe you should move down here full time. And then they came down and we ended up winning a championship. And, um, but I just saw the impact, you know, my dad's a, you know, my dad's a, a spiritual man, a man of God. My mom is as well, but he's not someone like, you know, you could talk to my dad for 10 hours and you never hear him say a word. Uh, he, he lets his life speak for himself. And, um, and so I think the impact he has on people that are around him, I've, I've seen him, I've seen him build relationships with the toughest of kids, kids that, you know, come from trauma filled backgrounds, kids that, you know, you feel like, Hey, could I ever have something in common with them? I've seen my dad just kind of naturally have a connection with them. And so that's helped me because in my job for me to be good, I have to be me. Like I have to push people. I have to you know, grind things. I have to push buttons and people always get to see this side of me, which is my dad. They get to see this side of me, which is my wife. I mean, even in the NFL, my wife has every single player over to our house every single year, like in season, Thursday nights, the one night that we're together, she's going to have a different position group over because she loves the players. And so they get to see like my dad, they get to see my wife, they get to see my kids. Like, you know, in the first week that I was here, all the, co the co coaches kids were running around the facility and it was like joy was back in my heart because that's what it was like at Temple and Baylor. So back to my dad, he, they ended up moving with us to Baylor. You know, it was a Christian university. 
that had, you know, the football program at least had lost its way. And I needed, you know, like I, I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not my father. I needed someone like armed in the way that he's armed. And, you know, he, he'll do like a staff devotional for anybody that wants it. And I've seen guys on our staff who really maybe not, don't believe in anything um, come weekly because they feel fed and the mm -hmm. spirit feels fed. So um, I'm grateful for it. it. It's helped me through some really hard times. My, my first year at Baylor, no one wanted me there. Um, we're oh and whatever. And my, my dad, he looked at me and he said, hey, hey Matt, like you're, you're going to rebuild Baylor football one relationship at a time. And I just kind of stopped like and just turned to the players. And that if, if there's anything I hope that I do well, it's that I try to build relationships with the players as best I can. And that all kind of came from him. So, you know, he, he, they're going to stay in Charlotte. They're not going to come here to Nebraska. They're going to raise my son for me my senior year. And what's convicting and probably hard for me is like, like my son had another year. All I wanted to do was get my son through one high school. Like he's moved so much for me, sacrificed so much for me. I mean, this is our third move in six years. This is hard, but you know what? Um, he's in good hands. And I think for my son, um, he wanted to do this, but I recognize he's never going to live with me again. Like, you know, it, there's time for your kids to leave the nest. I just thought it was going to be next year, not this year. So that's the one, the hardest sacrifice. And if people say like, you know, what took, you know, probably the, if I'm sorry if I'm talking too long. But if, that, if people sometimes wonder, like, what took us so long within negotiating this, I was trying to come to terms with the fact that I wasn't going to be my son's at-home father anymore. And I really wouldn't have taken this job. It, it's an amazing job, and it's the right fit for me. Um, if Brian hadn't been like, take the job. You know, and he was trying to convince me to let him have his own apartment in Charlotte. And, and I was like, you know, you ain't living my, on your own until you're out of high school. So I think he had an end game there. But but I, he wanted me to be here. He wanted to see me coach. And so... Uh, but but family, like we, we came here because we thought this was right for our family, and I'm in this position because of my family. So I like to be around my family, and right now I'm not. So it's interesting. I'm listening to the, just the parallels are kind of uncanny, right? My I said, you know, my father was my best friend, and and you know his words of wisdom kind of supported a position change. I was a quarterback my whole life, and I didn't move to running back until I was a senior. And I just remember he was in education. Now he's assistant superintendent. Uh, he was the first black coach to win a national championship at a predominantly white university. He won two wrestling national championships in, at, at then Omaha, which is now UNO. And I remember clearly, and I say this because you talked about as an adult your relationship with your dad. So I, which made me think, okay, I fought this mystique, this this prowess, this image, if you will, even though I knew he, he's a good man that wanted to do good for his family. I remember kind of swimming upstream, right? Here's a, here's an African-American male in a position of leadership in the school district. And you know, people called us the Huxtables. And I, I just knew in my heart, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be too black for some, not black enough for others. So I was trying to figure out how I was going to be. And you, did you ever struggle with that? Growing up, because you immediately fast forwarded to the impact he had when you were an adult. What was it like in the those formative years that allowed you to know that hey, when he's coming down to camp, that's somebody that I want to be around? Yeah, you know, I, I've I've never heard my my father. Not only have I never heard my parents even argue, I've never heard him say a cross word. Mm. And at the same time, like like my dad coached me, he's a tough man. And so I, I learned early on that you can be. You can you can be really tough and hold people accountable and and also like we had standards in our house. Like I don't my my kids go stay at my parents' house. The rules have changed. Like the no TV, the no this, the like that I grew up with. They're they're gone now as grandparents. But like we had we had structure and discipline and rules. Yet there was always love. And I think that's what a lot of kids miss nowadays. It's like either they they come from this you know they come from a background of like permissive where they're allowed to do whatever they want. Or they come from this world of like, hey, a lot of discipline, but not a lot of love behind it. And the greatest gift I think we can give young people is like that we love you so much that we're going to hold you accountable, but there's nothing you can ever do to make me not love you. Like that's, and that's how I grew up. And that's how I felt. Now, I certainly went through my phases and yeah. I certainly went through my times. And there was a time when we moved away from New York City and moved to Pennsylvania. And there's a lot of factors in it, but I know I certainly was one of them. And I certainly was me starting to go down this path of, you know, just, I, I, I love graffiti and I, you know, it's one thing to love graffiti, and I mean, love doing graffiti. I love 
I love. You gotta tell me this, like graffiti. I just started getting involved in like things that, like you know, like that. That in, in in the end would not be me, right? And so in those formative years, and and um, so we, you know, and a lot, like I said, a lot of things in our family led my dad to move to Pennsylvania. But when I talk about my father, my, my father picked our family up. Like we lived in New York City. My dad was on self support as a minister. Then eventually took a job teaching while he also would run the midnight basketball centers like down in the toughest neighborhoods. And so like. We grew up in kind of a blue collar area. My my dad taught at one of the nicest private schools, which been then I couldn't then go to one of the nicest private schools. But then at night he would be running, you know, basketball down in Hell's Kitchen or all these before it was Disneyland, you know, coming some tough places. And I got to be around people. And I think the thing for me, Damon, is like people are people. Like people talk a lot about coaches and players and this and that. People are people, and just see people for who they are as people, and it changes your perspective. Like. I, some of the people that they see me and they see the the Huskers coach, but I'm just Matt. Like I'm just a person. Like like so, I think I learned all these kind of lessons from him. I, like I said, I, I, n- I never saw him angry. I never saw him, um, but at the same time, like he was a tough coach. And and hopefully, you know, when you hear me talk, you've heard me talk many times. When I talk about like, hey, we have a mission to be great and win championships and all that, but we also have a purpose of having people's lives like. Like my parents just got back from three months in, in Rwanda, you know, uh, working in orphans there because that's what they do every year. And and so like giving is the highest form of living. Uh, my dad chose to do it as a minister. My mom chose to do it as a crisis, crisis worker and with women. Um, I choose to do it as a football coach. And in all the ways that we do it, um, if we're giving to other people, then I think we're living a purpose-filled life. And so the, all those things kind of hit me. And it's like when people ask me, like, why did you get into co- Why would you coach when you could have taken a year off? It was because I don't coach to coach. I coach to like be around these 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 young men, right? And so I had been away from them for a couple of years, and I was ready to get back to them. And so that all comes full circle to me. But I couldn't have been more blessed in the way that I was raised. Um, you know, it's it was pretty special.